Thank you, Matt. It's a great pleasure to be here during the first year of the Humanities Center and to be able to participate in a digital humanities symposium, which is a, um, certainly one of the most exciting areas um, in the humanities right now. Um, and one that um, I'm beginning to explore in this, in this current book project. Um, so um, uh, my work is situated, as Matt has mentioned, in the field of literary studies that calls itself eco-criticism, has called itself eco-criticism or environmental literary studies since the early 1990s, and which is now shading into the broader area of environmental humanities that ties environmental approaches from various disciplines together. Um, and so the book I'm currently working on looks at cultural representations of endangered species and extinctions. And I started out um, with it in a fairly conventional, conventional way for a literary critic, looking at literary texts, films, and photographs, so pretty standard material. Um, and so what interested me about this material was to figure out what kinds of narrative and metaphor we use in thinking and writing about endangered species. Um, what cultural kinds of concern and what affect these express, and what social and political implications might be. Creative nonfiction and popular science very quickly became part of the project, uh, just because so many journalists, activists, and biologists try to alert the public to biodiversity loss with these genres. But then the more research I did on the project, um, and the more I talked to scientists, to ecologists, biologists who work on um, species loss, um, the more it became clear to me that biodiversity databases, and particularly red lists of endangered species, and then the laws for their protection um, that come out of these red lists are equally expressions of cultural concern um, and of shared risk perceptions. And so that led me to the digital humanities, since I, it turned out I had to actually engage with these biodiversity databases. And so what I'll present today links my research in eco-criticism with research that I've done over the past two years on biodiversity databases with the help of digital humanities um, specialists, both at Stanford and at UCLA. So um, these are non-literary artifacts in a very, in a very literal sense. Um, and so approaching these artifacts with the training of a literary scholar made it clear to me that databases and red lists rely in some part on some of the same narrative structures that also shape the literary and visual portrayals of endangered species. At the same time, the database format itself has migrated back into literature and into visual art, and so I'll focus a little bit on this back and forth today. And my goal will be to show how particular narrative and non-narrative forms shape public discourse about environmental risk and what the implications of these forms are. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on an element of epic that is actually inherent in, um, in biodiversity databases. Sorry for changing the title um, uh, after I, I communicated to the original version. Um, now, just to frame this a bit, so um, environmentalism, um, over the two centuries of its, um, of its existence, if you count sort of conservationist movements that emerged in the early 19th century, has um, essentially relied on a narrative of the decline of nature as its sort of basic story. Um, that is the idea that, um, that uh, nature declines or is even destroyed under the impact of modern societies. Um, so that was a perception that arose with a massive, first massive wave of industrialization of the 19th century and at the turn of the 19th century in Britain and continental Europe and then in North America. Um, that shift from seeing humans threaten, uh, uh, threatened by an at least indifferent and at worst hostile natural world to seeing an essentially benevolent nature threatened by humans marks um, that historical point and it lays the groundwork for the emergence of the first conservation movements in the second that became institutionalized in the second half of the 19th century. The main narrative legacy of this period, and Raymond Williams has pointed this out for Britain, Leo Marx for the United States, and many of their successors, is a narrative that casts nature as in and of itself harmonious and home homeostatic, but then gets, um, that then gets precipitated downward um, on a long slope of decline by the intervention of modern societies. Um, now that 
that impending destruction of nature has loomed really large in Western cultures for um, the last 200 years, and it also has increasingly come to form part of a fair number, though not all, non-Western perceptions of the natural world. Now, what exactly threatens nature over time changes. So in Britain, um, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was um, the enclosure of the com commons and the rise of heavy industry. Um, in America, it was the construction of railroads, deforestation, and the uh, perceived decline of indigenous cultures. Um, in the 1960s, if we fast forward, it was population growth, pollution, and anticipated resource shortages. Um, in the 70s, it was acid rain and dying forests. In the 80s, ozone depletion um, came to the fore as the main concern. From the 1990s onward, environmentalists have been really concerned about, um, about biodiversity loss. And then um, for the last decade, of course, climate change has been the one dominant topic of conversation. So the concrete risk scenario that we focus on changes, um, but the overall narrative of the decline of nature remains very similar. And now that narrative, why is it so powerful? Why does it keep coming back? Well, particularly in the period up to the 1960s, um, it functioned as a very powerful counterpoint to the more dominant um, stories about constant progress and, um, and, um, and, and technological improvement. So it helped to crystallize diverse forces of resistance to modern society, and it's had to some extent continued to do that over the last few decades. Um, in other words, um, a lot of people weren't primarily environmentalists, especially in Europe and especially after the failure of the 68 revolutions, actually turned to environmentalism as an alternative mode of resisting what they saw as the more oppressive structures of modernization. Um, <clears throat> but with the emergence of the modern environmental movement, which happened you know, in the West and around the world in the 1960s and 70s, this story of nature in decline has itself become extremely predictable. It's sort of acquired normative force, and so as a consequence, um, it has now given rise to counter-narrative of its own, or at least critical narratives. Um, and so that's taken different shapes. So for example, environmental historians have um, really dismantled the idea that nature was harmonious or homeostatic. Um, before um, Europeans, modern Europeans, destroyed it. Um, environmental historians of North America, Latin America, and Australia have all shown that indigenous peoples had transformed the flora and fauna of those continents for millennia, in the case of Australia, tens of millennia before Europeans arrived. Now, not maybe as drastically and in different ways, but um, essentially what Europeans in Australia and North America encountered were human-made landscapes, whether they recognized them as such. Um, or not. Um, and um, so, um, uh, and, and in general, uh, envi especially work in environmental history has shown that it's actually very difficult to sort of tell a single story of rise or decline about the development of the environment in any particular area. Um, and when you talk to environmental journalists and communicators in various media, whether it's bloggers or people who write for um, newspapers or people who try to make environmental documentaries, what all of them will tell you is that there is a rising tide of environment fatigue among their audiences. That is, the public in many countries, not just in the U.S., thinks it already knows what the environmental story is, and it doesn't kind of want to hear the story of impending doom and further decline, destruction of nature one more time. So there's also a pragmatic problem that has arisen for this kind of narrative. So um, for these reasons, there's currently really a very fundamental shift underway in American environmentalism and to some extent also in other kinds of environmentalisms around the world. But particularly in the United States, um, there is now an urgent question of what other kinds of stories do we have to tell about nature that don't always boil down to, oh, you know, if we don't reform our ways, it's all going to be gone within two decades. Um, now, um, now, um, what, so, so assuming that, that this narrative of decline, however, is in some ways fundamental to environmentalist thought, so what other shapes can the environmental um, de imagination take? Um, since declensionist narratives are usually explicitly or Im implicitly oriented toward a particular moment of the past as a paradigm by which you judge the present, um, are there other ways that in which we can orient environmentalist, environmentalist thinking toward the future? and the future not just as a diminished or damaged version of the present, but as something more positive. And Matt already mentioned this notion of the Anthropocene, 
which um, in many circles I think has emerged as a shorthand for envisioning a, a, na a natural world that will be thoroughly shaped by humans so that the question becomes not how do we restore the nature of the past, but what is the kind of nature we want for the future. So, so uh, this is just to outline a little bit the more general questions or frameworks against which my current interest in cultural representations of species extinction has taken shape. Um, so since the late 19th century, environmentalist risk perceptions have tended to focus either on habitats or on species or on human health. Um, and in response, the movement has created work to create na national parks and nature reserves, has enacted treaties and laws about endangered species, um, and anti-pollution legislation, clean air, clean water, and so forth, in many places have been the most visible manifestations of this threefold concern. So I'll to focus today just on species at risk. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, um, to start with, is I'll, I'll briefly summarize how biodiversity loss is um, scientifically envisioned and then um, talk also briefly about mourning and elegy as a prominent genre in narrative and visual representations of species loss. Um, and then I'll zero in on the, on the databases as a sort of alternative way of, of talking about um, endangered species. Now, um, as I'm sure you already know, um, we are currently confronted with um, what scientists call a mass extinction of species, and it's one of a kind that ha that's rarely occurred before um, in the history, the 3.5 billion years of history um, uh, on, of life on the, on the planet. Now, extinctions of individual species, of course, are totally a normal part of evolution. Um, conventional Darwinism already had it that as better adapted species emerge, the less adapted ones die out. Um, now, so this is a normal process, and biologists refer to this routine disappearance as the so-called background level of extinction, which is um, roughly one species every four years. But currently, extinctions occur um, at what are estimated to be 50 to 500 times the background level. And if you add to that species where we don't know exactly what's going on with them, it might be as much as 100 to 1,000 times the background rate. At this rate, um, up to 50% of currently existing species might be um, eliminated by 2100 in the estimate of some biologists. Um, and these mass extinctions are really rare. They've only occurred five times before. Um, and each time it took millions of years for biodiversity to get back to its pre-disaster level. But in one respect, the current mass extinction of species is completely unprecedented. Um, all of the earlier mass extinctions, the last was um, 65 million years ago when um, Earth got hit by a meteorite and that wiped out not just the dinosaurs, but 75, 80% of um, species then existing. Um, humans weren't around then, and they weren't around for any of the others before then. But now humans not only are present to witness it, but they are, in fact, um, bear the major responsibility for most of the extinctions that are now taking place. Um, biologists have come up with this really charming acronym HIPPO to, um, to summarize the most prominent causes of species extinction. So it's habitat destruction, far and away the most important one, invasive species, uh, human population growth, pollution of various kinds, and then overhunting and over, over collecting. What the consequences might be of that large scale of biological change, nobody really knows in any detail. But here are some of the things that people are talking about. So um, ecosystems and the services they provide to human societies might decline or collapse. Um, genetic diversity at all levels from you know, subspecies variation to species to ecosystems might be reduced. Um, we might lose energy and food resources for the future as well as possible medical resources, and then last but not least, um, important cultural assets might be, might be destroyed in the process. So this is, um, this is the kind of scenario that has led some biologists like E.O. Wilson at Harvard and uh, Rodolfo Dirso at Stanford to argue that actually um, biodiversity loss might be as serious or more serious than climate change, but it's not currently being discussed quite as aggressively as climate change is. Now, during the last two or three decades, biodiversity loss has also become a central environmentalist concern. And I've just put, you know, um, a, a very small subset of the total number of just books that have been written on either the disappearance of individual species or the mass extinction as a whole 
on this slide. You could add many, many more. Um, and of course, um, uh, uh, this is not, it's not limited to um, just books. There are also hundreds of photographs, documentary films, paintings, travel writings, novels, poems, musical compositions, and digital artworks. Um, species extinction, of course, for those of you who are sci-fi buffs, um, has also popped up in science fiction um, from the 1960s, from Philip K. Dix to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, to uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Galapagos, and more recently, Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Craig. And most recently, it's actually also become an important part of mainstream American fiction. Um, as a concern that um, comes to shape certain characters' dispositions in much the way that other preoccupations with wealth, professional success, marital infidelity, or fear of death do. So think of Lydia Millet's How the Dead Dream, which I'll come back to a little later, Jonathan Franzen's Freedom from 2010, or T.C. Boyle's When the Killing's Done from 2011. Um, as they're portrayed in these novels, endangered species and their conservation have just become part of the makeup of the average American middle class psyche. So it's part of routine kinds of alienation and anomia, right? Now, most of the visual, verbal, and musical works um, engage with the disappearance of species by using some of the genre templates and rhetorical strategies of elegy and tragedy. So what they usually do is they portray these admirably well-adapted organisms that were doing just fine until we evil humans came along and drove them to the brink of extinction, and that was you know, no fault of their own. And I shouldn't say evil humans. Actually, um, uh, the extinction is, uh, is portrayed in fairly nuanced ways. Um, sometimes humans are um, hubristic. They're arrogant, um, indifferent, and ignorant. Um, uh, and sometimes um, you know, it's explicit, um, explicit greed or, or evil intent that motivates them. Um, and so you find in this context sort of very familiar tropes of melancholy, mourning, and loss. Um, these accounts, um, and it doesn't matter whether they're novels or documentary um, uh, writing or film, tend to focus on a fairly familiar range of species, and you probably all know what these are called. It's the, what, what, um, what is often referred to as so-called charismatic megafauna, right? So large and fascinating mammals and birds, so gorillas, polar bears, pandas, tigers, white rhinos, whales, and then among the birds, sort of condors, woodpeckers, and parrots make an appearance. Attractive frogs, if they're brightly colored like the one you showed, Stephen, they get some coverage, but most other reptilians, amphibians, and fish do not, and among the invertebrates, really only butterflies get any coverage at all. Worms, fungi, plants, and microorganisms don't, even though you could argue that they're no less affected by extinction, and in some cases, also quite important for ecological function. Now, the fate of the species that um, do attract attention is often narrated as part of histories of modernization. So they function as synecdoche, sort of as part of the whole, for turning points in a particular culture's move toward modernity and for what was left behind at those junctures. And I've written an article about this, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm just going to refer you to that and not, not come back to this. Um, so, so the idea in this article is that the species that we select out in the end, um, it's not about the species itself, it's what, about how we have changed and what we've lost at the moment that our culture got modernized. But um, this, so this elegiac template for portraying species um, that are endangered often combines and sometimes competes with a different form, the database. And now the database is um, a form that, that media theorists consider fundamental to contemporary culture. So even when the focus is on one endangered species, lists of others often superimpose themselves in these texts and films. Conversely, elements of the elegiac narrative of nature's decline um, also uh, is also embedded in digital biodiversity databases, though these databases also work forcefully to shift from the time-oriented affect of melancholia to a spatially and, I will argue, epically configured imagination of the planet at risk. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly look at this move from elegy to catalog, um, and then I'm going to look at one of the most um, well-known and most used uh, used um, global biodiversity databases, the IUCN Red List. Um, I'm going to go back to sort of literature and photography to illustrate how this has migrated back, and finally, just very briefly, swing back to the IUCN Red List to see how it actually talks about humans. <laughs> 
so um, what, I'll, what I'll emphasize throughout all of this is um, moments of interface between um, a basically closed narrative of decline and an open, incomplete field of species lists and the way in which these two different genres interact. So let me just give you, just to give you the flavor though, let me start with one clear example of elegiac rhetoric. So the first extinction that came to be seen in connection with modernization was that of the dodo. It's a large flightless pigeon that inhabited the island of Mauritius and was last sighted in 1662. Um, this is a reconstruction. The dodo looms large in a lot of books and films on extinction because it was the first species whose end had to be clearly attributed to human intervention. So it in some ways signals a global historical turning point where the deadly consequences of exploration and colonization for the natural world became really visible. Now, the story of the dodo features very prominently in one of the best known popular scientific books on species extinction, David Quammen's The Song of the Dodo, which came out in 1996. So um, Quammen has this super long chapter um, that, that is called Rarity Unto Death, um, where he says, look guys, we, we have to not always think about the last individual of a species. That's really ecologically not that important because the last individual, for that matter, the last two dozen, can but just be wiped out by a storm, by a disease, by some kind of natural disaster. What we really have to ask is how does a population get so small that it um, becomes susceptible that it, that it, to these kinds of um, to these kinds of accidents. How does a population get so small that it can be wiped out by a single incident? Okay, so that's a perfectly sensible biological argument to make. But then, in a very telling non sequitur, uh, Quammen turns around and he tells us the story of the death of the last dodo. So here's what he says. Imagine a single survivor, a lonely fugitive at large on mainland Mauritius at the end of the 17th century. Imagine, right? We don't know anything about the last dodo and when and how it died. Imagine this fugitive as a female. She would have been bulky and flightless and befuddled, but resourceful enough to has, have escaped and endured when the other birds didn't, or else she was lucky. Imagine that her last hatchling had been snarfed by a feral pig, that her last fertile egg had been eaten by a monkey, that her mate was dead, clubbed by a hungry Dutch sailor, and that she had no hope of finding another. During the past half dozen years, longer than a bird could remember, she had not even set eyes on a member of her own species. Raffles cuculatus had become rare unto death, but this one flesh and blood individual still lived. Imagine that she was 30 years old or 35, an ancient age for most sorts of bird, but not impossible for a member of such a large-bodied species. She no longer ran, she waddled. Lately, she was going blind. Her digestive system was balky. In the dark of an early morning in 1667, say, during a rainstorm, she took cover beneath a cold stone ledge at the base of one of the Black River cliffs. She drew her head down against her body, fluffed her feathers for warmth, squinted in patient misery. She waited. She didn't know it, nor did anyone else, but she was the only dodo on Earth. When the storm passed, she never opened her eyes. This is extinction. Well, he's just told us that this is not extinction. This is not what we should focus on. But he focuses his narrative here on the single individual that he presents as a female, which then allows him to portray her in these cliches of the bereaved mother and wife um, and the frail elderly lady with health problems. Um, at the same time, of course, he, he sort of conveys a sense of affection and bemusement for this imaginary last dodo through pathetic fallacy. So he juxtaposes the grim weather and the um, bird's physical suffering with the fate of the species as an abstract entity. Now, recent cultural theory has had a great deal to say about mourning melancholia in the way grief relates to politics, and that in some ways explains why passages like this are so powerful, even though they don't seem to really make sense. Um, so Judith Butler, Clifton Spargo, and Rah um, Jahan Ramazani, um, philosophers and literary critics, um, have shown this. Um, Catriona Mortimer Sandilens has mobilized this body of theory by arguing that at the core of environmentalist thought lies melancholia, the suspended mourning for an object of loss that is real but ungrievable because non-human beings and natural environments and ecological processes are just not usually considered appropriate objects of grief in our culture. So she says, in late capitalism, nature nostalgia, eco-tourist pilgrimages to endangered wildernesses, documentaries of dying peoples and places, even environmentalist com campaigns to save particular habitats and species against the onslaught of development are exactly a form of melancholy nature in that they incorporate environmental destruction into the ongoing 
workings of commodity capitalism. And I'm um, linking eco-criticism to queer theory and the AIDS experience. She then goes on to propose that melancholia is not only a denial of the loss of a beloved object, but also a potentially politicized way of preserving that object in the midst of a culture that fails to recognize its significance. So she says, unlike Freud, he thought, you know, prolonged mourning melancholia that you don't come back from is a pathological condition. She says, well, that may be so, but actually, that kind of prolonged mourning can have a really important um, public function and environmentalism's nostalgia that expresses itself in books like Hammond's for endangered and extinct species is one form um, that an essentially political impulse takes. Um, I would agree with her, I think, in broad outline, though I'm less confident than she is that we can distinguish in the way that she does here in this upper quote between sort of authentic moments um, of mourning with their sort of more com commodified counterparts. I think um, often it's precisely the commodified experiences that in the end do succeed in drawing people's um, interest and awareness to uh, conservation. Now, texts or paintings that are concerned with endangered species often express that um, a, a sense that the, the elegiac focus on the, fo on the uh, fate of a particular individual or a particular species falls short when you think really about the magnitude of the biodiversity crisis globally. And at these moments, um, these, these kinds of um, uh, uh, passages of remembrance and mourning, like the one involving the last dodo and Quammen, give way to enumerations that move fast through entire series of disappearances. Um, and Quammen himself does this. He goes back and forth, he goes back and forth between elegiac moments and then simple lists. And here's an example. Um, so here he talks about um, Hawaii. Mm. And so he describes the ecological processes and then says the Laysan honeycreeper is extinct, the lesser koa finch is extinct, so are the greater koa finch and the Kona grosbeak and the Hawaiian rail. The greater amakihi is extinct, as are the Oahu nukupu'u and the kioea and the Oahu o'o, and at least three out of four subspecies of Akialoa. Okay? And then um, a few pages later, he talks about Guam and the um, havoc that the brown tree snake has, has wreaked there. Then the Guam flycatcher went extinct, blip. The br bridled white eye disappeared, blip. The rufous fantail, the white throated ground dove, the Mariana fruit dove, the mi mi Micronesian honey eater, blip, 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 blip. Of the 11 forest dwelling species, these six all vanished from Guam during the mid 1980s. Now, these kinds of catalogs are also super common in books on extinction. And in fact, um, you know, a lot of the books that are travel logs are just really a way of of giving you a catalog by way of a trip around the world. So, um, so this is a different way of going about pointing us to species at risk. The list or database that seeks to name and describe all known species and to classify them according to their risk of extinction. Umberto Eco has pointed out in a wonderful book on lists throughout the ages that certain kinds of lists for foreground their own incompletion as a way of pointing toward those things that can't really be listed or enumerated. Um, and so that, I think, gives one interesting window um, on databases, um, that, which I'll now talk about in a little more detail. So the rapid pace of species loss has been one of the major impulses in the creation of at least half a dozen global biodiversity da data, databases that have been created over the last two or three decades. Um, so the Encyclopedia of Life, which is um, uh, pioneered by E.O. Wilson, um, the Catalog of Life Consortium for the Barcode of Life, that's mostly sort of a genetics enterprise, um, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, then the IUCN Red List, which started out as a red list, but now inc increasingly includes leaf concerns, sort of unendangered species, and so has become um, a database. And then you have other kinds of databases that are also global in their scope, but they don't cover all taxa. So BirdLife International focuses on the um, 10,000 um, uh, known species of birds, and the recently completed census of marine life sought to explore all marine species and turned up really um, amazing things. Now, putting together these kinds of global databases means assembling information from tens of thousands of sources and formats. Um, and this, in and of itself, is really a Herculean labor. Um, it's arduous, time-consuming, labor-intensive, and expensive. Um, not all of the database projects have all the funding they need, and so the question if and, way, if and when they will ever complete their task remains open for a lot of these. 
Um, but the encyclopedic or epic aspiration to document all known life forms is all the more an ongoing cultural as well as scientific project. So these databases um, contribute to constructing a particular way of relating to the natural world. Um, and I would argue that they are actually one of the forms that nature writing takes in the contemporary period. Um, and they might be understood as part of a broader trend that media theorists have pointed out, the rise of the database as a new cultural form and really a genre that needs its own poetics and aesthetics. So the most well-known of these theorists is no doubt Lev Manovich. Um, he proposed in his 2001 book, The Language of New Media, that the database is a cultural form of its own and a new symbolic form of the computer age, a new, a new way to structure our experience of ourselves and of the world. Um, and he then goes on to say that as a cultural form, the database represents this wor the world as a list of items and it refuses to order this list. In contrast, a narrative creates a cause and effect trajectory of seemingly unordered items. Therefore, database and narrative are natural enemies. Now, um, those of you in literature may know that he's caught a lot of flack for that last <laughs> sentence um, uh, and, and drawn fire in particular from Catherine Hales, who has argued that on the contrary, database and narrative are complementary genres. Um, Anna Manovich himself um, has actually suggested a more interesting analogy whereby narrative derives its meaning syntagmatically, by which he means um, it orders data in a sequence, whereas the database is in its basic structure paradigmatic. It lists all the, um, all the possible data in a particular field. So narrative, in his view, becomes a particular way of drawing on or traversing a database. And the distinctiveness of contemporary culture, in his view, would then be that database, the paradigm, is given material existence, while narrative, the syntagma, is dematerialized. Paradigm is real, syntagma virtual. It's a really interesting suggestion because um, the implicit argument here is that in the past it was the other way around. It was narrative that we had and we had to infer other possibilities, right? So the data assembled in a database can be mobilized for a variety of cultural forms and functions um, and for aesthetic, administrative, or scientific genres with narrative one among them. So um, I think this is an important idea um, because um, it articulates a core principle of the database that makes it different from other kinds of printed inventories or catalogs. Um, but Manovich, I think, understates the way in which the encoding of data constrains what kinds of narrative mobilizations or traversals of the data are possible. Each item in a database, and if you've ever searched or bought anything online, you know this, has to be tagged with so-called metadata, classificatory tags, in such a way that it can be found and retrieved. I mean, if you're looking for a shirt, I mean, whatever you look for, you know, something has to link it to your search item shirt, right? So it has to be tagged in that way. And this is also true of um, species information. So the historian of science, Jeffrey Bowker, who's an impassioned critic of many of the classifying and archiving systems that characterize contemporary science, has pointed out that biodiversity databases typically include information on taxonomy, ecology, information me conservation me measures, and so on. But usually there's no category that includes any kind of indigenous knowledge about the species, nor for that matter, um, any cultural form of knowledge about the natural world. So the question here isn't for him which particular data do or don't get stored in a database, but what you can store in the database by virtue of its structure as a matter of principle. Now, let me explain, this is all a lot of theory, I realize, but let me explain how these media theoretical perspectives matter for um, a particular kind of biodiversity database, namely the red list. So red lists, in addition to the usual biological and ecological information, classify species in terms of how endangered they are. And as opposed to purely descriptive databases, they typically have normative and legal force. So a species that's included in a, in a red list can only be hunted or harvested within particular limits. It cannot be traded. Its habitat can't be altered in any major way. Um, you have to implement measures to protect it, and so on and so forth. So nations and states and international organizations like the EU all keep these kinds of red lists as the basis for endangered species laws and international treaties. 
Because of the material impacts that listing or delisting a species can have, the process is often politically embattled, and the additions and subtractions from a red list or changes in the status of a species register a history of such conflicts and of conservationist successes and failures. I mean, you all know the um, sort of the frequent battles over listing or delisting wolves um, from the red lists of various states um, within the U.S. Now, um, arguably, the, the most influential current red list is that of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. It's a truly global red list, but is, as I mentioned, an unusual hybrid. It doesn't have any legal force in and of itself, but it's constantly quoted in conservation research and often becomes the basic point of departure for planning um, conservation in a particular region. It's acquired an indirect legal force, and its administrators have written up meticulously detailed guidelines on how to use the global information of their database and local context. And there's a whole story there about the local and the global, which I can't go into here today. The spatiality of databases is really, really fascinating. Um, so originally, the IUCN Red List focused only on endangered species, but then over the last decade in particular, it's in increasingly included non-endangered species. And so that's why it's become one of the most comprehensive um, global biodiversity databases. But it still retains from its original uh, function as a Red List the classification of species in terms of risk. Now, um, when you go um, online, um, uh, what you'll find is um, sort of this bar with the nine different categories, um, usually at the top, and there's a little um, a sort of a tree diagram here um, that makes it clear how they relate to each other. So as you can see, there's nine categories. So you have um, two that designate species where we simply don't know enough to really determine uh, how much risk there are. You have um, uh, uh, two categories that refer to species that are not endangered, so least concern and near threatened. Then you have three categories of endangerment, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered, and two categories of extinction. Um, now, um, obviously, there's a certain kind of narrative that is hardwired into these very categories. So as you'll notice immediately, extinction and endangerment are defined positively, where species that are faring pretty well are tagged with negative or approximative labels. So near threatened, least concern. Why don't you just call them uh, safe? Right, uh, that would be one, one obvious one. Um, or, um, and anyway, and so, um, so uh, uh, in addition, when you listen to biologists talk about these, um, a species that moves from vulnerable to near threatened, so that is actually safer, um, is referred to as being downgraded, whereas one that moves from vulnerable to endangered is referred to as upgraded. This is kind of an odd reversal of the value judgments that usually come with upgrading and downgrading. Scientists have also pointed out that it's much easier to get funding for a species that is classified in one of the three endangered categories than it is for, to get um, funding for research on these kinds of species, although the data deficient ones are the ones that most obviously would need the research um, most urgently. So the metadata structure um, and the way in which it's um, institutionally used imply a hierarchy of values that places the greatest investment in endangered species with critically endangered at the summit. The more endangered a species is, the more valued it becomes in a logic that resonates both with the capitalist valuation of scarce resources and with the cultural fascination that we've inherited from the Romantic age with um, impending death, sort of the aura of the last that we already saw in Quammen. So the, the, this um, categorization structure of the IUCN database is, in other words, underwritten by some of the same elegiac impulses that are also so dominant in the literature on endangered species. And uh, the complex interweaving of the red list structure with narrative doesn't stop there. Um, as you can imagine, this sort of elaborate structure of nested um, risk categories didn't come into existence overnight. Red data books, when they were first um, put into use in the 1960s, used simple numbered categories, category one, two, and three. Um, and category one sort of was meant very rare and believed to be decreasing in numbers. Um, in 1968, the categories were changed to endangered, rare, depleted, and then various modifications occurred in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and in the, in the 80s, another thing happened. That was the moment when biodiversity, when the term was coined, 
and when uh, species laws actually move to the fore of environmentalist concerns and public debate. And so in that context, it was felt that Mm, you know, just asking the experts in a particular, on a particular taxon what they thought the status of a species was, was really kind of too approximative, that there had to be harder categories and that you also had to have ways of comparing the assessments of different specialists. And so at that moment, the IUCN started to introduce very elaborate um, quantitative criteria. That system was introduced in 1994 and then they revised it in, in 2001. Um, and so now the five core classifications of endangered species, so these, these five here, come with very specific quantitative criteria. So you can't just claim that something is endangered unless you can show the percentage to which the populations have declined over a certain number of generations. So this was an attempt to get away from narrative and to quantify, right? But narrative has made an odd comeback, precise, in some cases at least, uh, precisely as the consequence of quantification. So um, when I first started looking at the IUCN Red List online and actually reading a lot of the entries, um, one thing that immediately was striking was the very different amounts of text that different species come with. So some of them have literally like two lines. Others have very, very long textual entries. Um, and so um, when, we, when we sort of just ran a count, um, taking out all the sort of just function words um, that, that occur across different species, um, uh, we, th this is a list of the, of the 25 most text intensive species, um, so counted by character. So the sambar deer, which is an extremely widely, um, a, a widely um, spread population over, over Asia, um, is, is the one that has the longest text entry simply because all of the different populations have to be detailed in their different um, conditions. Um, and you can see that um, a lot of the top 25 um, are mammals. But the fourth longest entry among the tens of thousands in the red list is um, Eritmochilus imbricata, the hawksbill turtle, so a reptile. And um, when you, so the, this is what the hawksbill turtle looks like. And when you go to the entry online, you'll see that um, you have sort of the justification, you have the index sites. Um, data sources, you have sort of backward extrapolation. So there's a lot of, you know, what are the data for, for um, anything that we say about the, um, about the hawksbill turtle. Um, there's qualitative information, uncertainties in the, um, in the um, assessment process. And as you scroll down, um, you get, um, uh, especially under threats, you get a long historical foray into the tortoise shell trade, the history of the trade, 20th century trade. Um, there's, a, there's a passage on um, the Japanese um, tortoise shell trade in the 19th century. It just kind of goes on and on and on. And you wonder what is this whole historical disquisition doing in the middle of an entry that's supposed to just classify this species. And so I start wondering about this um, because this, this animal is so high up. On the, um, uh, on, the, on the text count um, in the IUCN red list. Um, and as it turned out, um, the historical narrative here really supplements unavailable quantitative data. So um, the hawksbill turtle is a critically endangered species. Now for a critically endangered species, according to these quantitative cri criteria, you have to prove that the population has declined 80% over the last three generations. And a generation for the IUCN is time to maturity plus sort of 10 years, just as a buffer zone, right? Okay, so that's perfectly reasonable for a lot of different kinds of organisms. But in the case of sea turtles, you have the little problem that these are extremely long-lived animals, and their run-up to sexual maturity is 30 or 40 years. So in order to determine whether there has been an 80% reduction of the population over three generations, you'd have to have numbers from the 1880s, the 1870s, even the 1860s. Um, and the sea turtles are global species. Um, nobody has these numbers even now. The numbers are quite approximative. Needless to say, nobody has any numbers from the 1860s or 1870s. Nobody had an interest in counting them then, and it would have been technically very difficult. Um, so what we do have is we do have numbers. The only numbers we have are those of the tortoise shell trade. So that's sort of used as a proxy here 
um, for determining how many hawksbill turtles and other kinds of sea turtles there might have been in the late 19th century. Um, as you can imagine, um, this did not leave a lot of the scientists involved in this research um, very happy because um, uh, based on these numbers, um, the hawksbill turtle is now classified as critically endangered even though the best estimates are that there's about two million of them around the globe. That's not a huge amount, but other critically endangered species like the kakapo are down to like 117 individuals or Spix's macaw down to less than 20 individuals. That's critically endangered. And so they're saying, no, a species with 2 million individuals should not be in the same category as these others. Um, and, so, um, and so a lot of the, um, uh, the, in the marine specialist turtle group, a lot of the scientists have now turned against these IUCN criteria and say that these simply cannot be meaningfully applied to their particular group of species um, because it forces them to sort of do historical research that will turn up numbers that are always kind of iffy in the end. And so they'd rather think about the present and future of the species than its unfathomable past. So a certain kind of narrative structure, a focus on nature in decline and de decrease extinction and the past is hardwired into these red list categories. But I think it would be very simplistic to just reduce red lists to another version of the elegiac mode that characterizes so many of the popular scientific, cinematic, and literary portrayals of species extinction. They, species databases also offer the potential for desentimentalizing extinction. However difficult the project of mapping all the world's species with one set of criteria may be, it redirects our attention from the fate of individual species to developments that affect tens of thousands of them. So typically, this more general perspective takes the form of statistics. So, for example, in, nine, in 2008, um, as the IUCN periodically does, um, it publishes these overviews of their findings. Now, obviously, you know, this is still um, a table that, that continues the focus on endangerment that is characteristic of the Red List as a whole. Um, but it also seeks to open up a view on the whole that the focus on individual species really can. Um, there's really two stories that this table tells us. Um, one is about um, a really epic struggle for biodiversity that a good deal of conservation literature also tells, in which scientists and activists assume heroic stature in their battles to rescue species from extinction. Passionate Davids taking on Goliaths of resistance from indifferent communities and often ignorant authorities in a fight in which nothing less than the future of Earth is at stake. As you can see here, of the 45,000 species um, that have been evaluated by 2008, it's a good deal more now, about 38% were classified as endangered. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty scary number. But there's also another story, which is precisely in that 45K, and by now I think it's, it's gone up to 65,000 species in the IUCN Red List. Um, with, and that is simply that we've only evaluated this many species out of the 1.8 million or so of species that we've identified. Um, and as this table shows, what species are assessed um, is subject to what's called an unmistakable taxonomic bias. So as you can see, all mammal and all bird species in the first two columns, it gives you the total number of how many species there are and then how many of them have been evaluated. So all mammals, all birds have been evaluated and you know, pretty much close to all amphibians, but with the reptiles and the fishes, we do a lot worse. And then you drop out of the realm of the vertebrates and immediately things get a lot worse. So 950,000 insects, we've assessed 1,200. Um, if you go to the ferns, um, about 13,000, we've assessed 211. Um, and mushrooms, 30,000 species, we've assessed one. I think uh, the latest count has it up to three. Um, so. Um, so uh, as this um, table shows, um, there's the same focus on, um, on particular kinds of taxa and species um, and, um, that, and the data that we make our statements about species extinction about are seriously incomplete. Um, now that incompletion is hardly grounds for optimism. If more species were assessed, the overall scenario might well turn out to be even worse than it seems now. Um, and scientists who generate this sort of perspective generally perceive biologic of 
synecdoche or surrogacy or proxy. They assume that species can stand in as a synecdoche, as a part for the whole of biodiversity in general, and that the species that have been studied convey a broadly accurate picture of the current fate of non-human species at large. Now, both of these are pretty tenuous assumptions, and they have been often questioned by scientists themselves. But precisely because they're so difficult and yet are being pursued, they illustrate just um, how strong this impulse is to generate an encyclopedia um, of all life forms on Earth and to generate an epic narrative, an epic about life on Earth and its fate in the future. Now, what I hope this analysis of Red List and biodiversity databases demonstrates is that they combine elements of the elegiac narrative of nature's decline, uh, which is built into the basic metadata with an epic aspiration toward documenting this global struggle in which the future of life and the planet itself are at stake. Um, and um, we saw already in David Clement's Song of the, the Dodo a similar tendency toward, on one hand, having these elegiac moments, but then having other passages that almost drop a kind of mathematical sublime, where just um, almost uncountable species are enumerated as a way of gesturing toward the whole. Um, now, let me um, show how this way, that duality and that way of thinking um, about um, counting species and the elegiac impulse in that um, have played themselves out in literature and in photography. Um, just one example quite quickly from literature, Lydia Millet's uh, novel, How the Dead Dream, which came out in 2008 and is the first of a, a really astonishing trilogy. Ghost Lights um, was the second volume and Magnificence just came out a few months ago. Um, uh, th which is also a wonderful novel in which species extinction, once again, um, is at the core. Um, let me just briefly talk about How the Dead Dream, and then we'll move on into the, into the visual art. Um, so this is a novel that uh, re re revolves around a protagonist, um, Thomas, just called um, T for short, who uh, is very skillful at business ventures from a very early age, and he turns into a successful um, real estate developer when he grows up. Um, initially, he has no aspirations or, or any thoughts about environmentalism at all, but then he experiences several severe human tragedies. The father leaves the family, the mother lapses into senile dementia, and his partner, Beth, dies in a car accident. Um, now, these traumatic separations from loved ones gradually attract his attention to the animal species that his construction projects put at risk. He begins to research species extinction, and he visits zoos with the explicit purpose of seeing endangered animals. After Beth's premature death, this interest evolves into a really strange kind of obsession. So he, um, uh, in, on certain nights, he will break into zoos so as to spend the night sleeping with particular an endangered animals in their enclosure, um, terminal animals, as the, um, as the novel calls them, um, always last, the last of their kind, a Mexican gray wolf, um, a female Sumatran rhino, um, and then he meditates on the spatial experience of a swarm of pupfish in a concrete tank. Um, and all of these attempts to connect um, to beings that are isolated from their original habitats and social ties quite transparently, if rather originally, relies on the genre template of the elegy, since it is his original mourning of Beth that leads T to break into these zoos. He himself is quite conscious um, of this connection, and he at one point sort of meditates on um, the death of a rat, just if a rat gets um, hunted by and eaten by a fox, does, that, does it make a difference if that rat is the last of its kind? Um, and he quite explicitly makes a connection here um, about loss being common in the natural world, but um, he, and he's aware that this connects to his own experience of mourning and melancholia, but still he thinks this has to be transferred to the natural world in some way. If a being could be so singular to another, there was no doubt that there was singularity elsewhere, that the irreplaceable nature of being was not limited to his own small circle. So a fairly abstract and lyrical way of expressing how this concern might open out from a single human individual to a whole, um, to a whole set of species. And that becomes even more obvious in the um, strange acknowledgments that follow the end of the novel. So the, the narrative kind of ends, and then there's these acknowledgments of friends and family. And then Millet um, launches um, into a dedication of the book 
to the memory of the West African black rhinoceros, which disappeared from the world in the time it took to write this book, and in honor of the rarest species in the United States, any of which may vanish in the blink of an eye, and then you get this whole enumeration of endangered species, which curiously start, stops at M. Um, and it's, it's, um, I tried to press her on this once when I, when I talked to her at an event, and she was sort of elusive on why that was the case and denied that it had any significance. It's hard to believe that, since obviously one of the next words could be millet in this list, you know, so who knows? Or maybe it's just a way of signaling incompletion. So this is a really interesting novel in which mourning leads from the human to the non-human and from the individual to entire species and biological taxa. Um, and this mourning does translate into social action in the second and third volumes. So um, the, the horizon of experience that this novel and also the subsequent ones describe remain very individual, um, but there is, a, there is then a larger area of concern um, that takes the reader quite relentlessly to a global panorama of risk and loss. Um, so um, painters and photographers um, have also adopted these kinds of enumerative strategies over the last um, two decades, and they're often quite explicit that what they want to capture is just the magnitude of biodiversity crisis. So Isabella Kirkland, for example, has adopted the genre of the still life. So she paints these um, meticulously detailed still lifes um, where, um, for example, you have this vase with these flowers in it, except they're not flowers, they're all endangered or extinct plants. And you have um, sort of a still life table with various animals and parts of animals, some living animals, some just parts um, that are all endangered or extinct. Um, you have somebody like Walton Ford who takes, um, who does these sort of satirical um, repetitions of Audubon's drawings. So um, the, the lovely, cheerful Carolina parakeets in John James Audubon's um, painting become sort of threatening in, um, in Walton Ford's Carolina parakeet that looks as if it's about to eat you. Um, or you have um, Tim Flannery, the climate scientist, and Peter Shouten's book, A Gap in Nature on Extinct Species. Again, meticulously detailed realist paintings that they researched by traveling to museums and seeing specimens um, around the world. And you have photographers. So for example, Susan Middleton and David Litschweger, who have published not just this one, but actually several volumes of close-up photography of endangered species, um, mostly animals, but also some plants. And then there's um, Joel Sartori, whose work has often appeared in National Geographic. Um, and then in 2010, he brought out this book called Rare, Portraits of America's Endangered Species. He's taken literally thousands of photos. Um, Rare is just one of his collections. If you go to his website, you'll find that he has um, a lot of others, one called Amphibian Vanishing, one just called the Biodiversity Collection, and so forth. Now, if you look at his, um, at one of his photos, the dusky seaside sparrow, um, it's an interesting photo. Um, it foregrounds how a living organism gets converted into an archival specimen, preserved in a jar and tagged for the archives. And the bird's isolation on the white background in a jar and in fluid visually um, brings home to you its loss of habitat, which is what this species died out of, uh, why it died out. But this is all a small, pathetic dead bird. Uh, and it's difficult not to feel compassion for it, especially um, when Sartori adds on his, um, on his website and in the book an explanatory caption with the bird's gender and name. So this is um, orange, the last male dusky seaside sparrow. So it's a move that's actually quite similar to, to quamen feminizing the last dodo. Um, so this is clearly in some ways an elegiac photo even as it also evokes the database of the museum with a little tagging and the sort of specimen thing. A lot of his other photos, and this is just the selection, makes that even more obvious. So he always has, he usually shots, shoots animals, very rarely plants, and he usually shoots all of them, no matter what kind of animal they are, in portrait style and against a stark black or white background. He explicitly links that to the Endangered Species Act and says because the Endangered Species Act protects all species, regardless of their use or, um, or um, uh, regardless of their use for humans or regardless of um, how valuable we consider them to be, that's what my photos and placing all these different species on the same kind of background tries to express. <laughs> 
And as you can see, this is a technique that yields quite, star quite startling results, especially when he shoots insects or fish or newts that are usually um, photographed as a whole when he takes these portrait-style photos of them. The equal treatment of vastly different species, though, also makes you as the viewer lose a sense of their size and proportion. And the, uh, these empty backgrounds become more disturbing as you see more of these pictures because the subjects are never embedded in any of their ecological habitats. Um, they seem artifactual and decorative. And that seems particularly true here of this fish, which was clearly shot in water, but then by taking it out of that water, it looks just like a stuffed mounted specimen. So it's a very, it's a very odd picture that sort of gets more disturbing um, as, you, as you look at it. Um, so these, the, the, so the, the, the fish in particular looks really strangely lifeless and, and like an artifact rather than a living being. Now, um, these photos seem to some extent to emerge from a fairly detached and not at all an ecological gaze. Um, and it seems to be sort of classificatory, classificatory. If you look at one of his websites, when you see sort of dozens of these pictures, the interest no longer seems to be in any individual species, but just um, in the scenario at large. Um, now, this same may seem to be at odds with an environmentalist perspective that usually foregrounds connectedness and rootedness. These are uprooted species, clearly. And, but I think that's precisely the point here. Sartori's photography wants to de-romanticize species and their disappearance. It shifts the conservationist appeal to really a purely aesthetic level. So Sartori's work becomes a visual red list. It documents the extent of the mass extinction crisis through the juxtaposition of dozens, in some cases hundreds, of photographs. And the individual photographs in collections such as Rare, The Vanishing, Amphibian Extinction, and Fragile Nature are joined together less by an obvious elegiac narrative than by the logic of inventory and database. And that conveys a sense of risk more through the sheer accumulation of numbers, through the sense of a numerical sublime, than through the expressiveness of any, any individual data point. So uh, an important perspective, and um, it's significant that, that Sartori's photography has now been included in turn in a project that I can only point to, I don't have the time to talk about it, a project called archive.net, um, initiated by David Attenborough, that collects visual, filmic, and photographic material on endangered species from around the world. Um, and it's um, given the peculiar aesthetic of that database, um, it's not surprising that Sartori's work um, was included in it. Uh, this is a database that quite deliberately wants to cultivate the viewer's sense of wonder at these various biological forms. So again, sort of not elegy, not melancholia, but a quite different effective approach. Now, what this desentimentalized perspective ultimately implies is perhaps no more, more obvious when the database aesthetic turns on humans themselves. So I wanted to conclude by looking up Homo sapiens in the IUCN Red List. So you'll be very gratified to find out, as you can see here at the top, that the IUCN Red List considers us least concerned. So we're not endangered. Um, and the reason um, that it gives for this is is here listed as least concern as the species is very widely distributed, adaptable, currently increasing, and there are no major threats resulting in an overall population decline. Um, and um, uh, when you um, scroll down to uh, major threats, um, we are reassured that there are currently no major threats to humans, although some subpopulations may be experiencing localized declines as a result of disease, drought, war, natural disasters, or other factors. And then um, under conservation um, actions, um, the IUCN Red List tells us, at present, no conservation measures are required. Humans are present in numerous protected areas throughout their range. So including Homo sapiens in a biodiversity database with an LC classification is, I think, a significant gesture, both politically and philosophically. It strikes a blow against apocalyptic kinds of environmentalist rhetoric that emphasize how humans are at risk from environmental crisis. At the same time, it encourages a sort of posthumanist approach that conceives of humans as one species among other species without the special status that humanism usually confers on us. That this tends to strike us as funny so shows just how unusual and perhaps uncomfortable a perspective this still is. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, many environmentalists have recently taken up this notion of the Anthropocene, 
that have, was proposed by Crutzen and Stormer in 2000. Humans' impact in the planet is now so pervasive, they suggest, that it can even be detected in um, geological strata. That might justify claiming that we no longer live in the Holocene, but that we've entered a new geological era. In this framework, it no longer makes sense to try to go back to a nature before agriculture or before colonization or before capitalism. Instead, the task is to design collectively and democratically what the nature of the future should look like. An epic task, truly, and one for which the genre of the epic, um, as it's represented, among other things, in the database, may well be more useful than elegy. Thank you. Right. Uh, it's a proxy, yeah. yeah. Let's, we know that carbon is the problem, and we know that human beings are putting the excess carbon into the atmosphere, and we know that's connected to the whole complexity of the problem. So that actually has sort of radically simplified the narrative around uh, climate change in a way that species extinction almost doesn't seem like it can compete, right? It's like there's too many factors and too many um, unknowns I think we're only finding out. Yeah, it's not yet clear. Just, yeah. Just yeah. So um, uh, it's, that's a that's a it's a horrendous question to ask because it's like huge and unanswerable at some level. But let me let me take a couple of couple of stabs at it. So I think the 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 the, the difference between the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis is that, uh, as you said, species extinction happens in a lot of different places for a lot of different reasons, but then they add up to a crisis that affects the whole globe. That's pretty different from climate change, where it's sort of linked to systemic changes that have to do with the, with the atmospheric structure of the whole planet. And it doesn't really matter where the origin of it was, now it affects the entire planet. So, um, so these are sort of relatively different kinds of risks. But um, the way in which they're similar is obviously in that they're both anthropogenic and that um, neither of them, I think, narratively speaking, lends itself to sort of direct observation, direct measurement. I mean, you always um, approach them. Biodiversity is really not something that you can talk about or experience as such. So you always pick proxies. You always pick surrogates. You always pick what we lit crit folks would call synecdoches, right? So in this case, it's particular species and last individuals. In the case of climate change, it's the melting glaciers that come up, you know, photographically represented where you can actually sh show something that can stand in for much more massive changes. Or again, particular species. I mean, the polar bear is actually um, a really interesting example of a species that doesn't have particular cultural significance, you know, outside of Arctic societies, yet that um, a whole huge part of the world population has latched onto as the symbol of climate change and, and what it does. Um, so I think in, in, in both of these cases, um, what's really amazing, and I know less about climate change and its details than I do about biodiversity, um, but in biodiversity, I mean, there's much as the, the overall picture is clear, the details are often just as murky as they are with climate change. And when climate change, uh, you know, scientists talk among themselves, 
biodiversity scientists talk among themselves. They, I think, also freely admit that. So in biodiversity, you have the issue all the way from what is a species, you know, and should we even focus on species rather than on populations? Um, what are we, I mean, there's, there's multiple issues in the actual accounting that come up. But then what to me, and I, you know, I started this project thinking, oh, the science is going to be pretty easy and straightforward, and what's going to be interesting is how that gets changed and filtered and adapted to different cultural contexts as it gets translated um, for the public at large. Um, that, boy, did that turn out to be wrong. You know, I mean, once I started reading this stuff on species extinction, it turned out it's not straightforward at all. I mean, there's lots of different um, angles on it, and the fact that we also know only about the fate of a fraction, the species we have no clue within an er order of magnitude even how many species inhabit the Earth, makes it actually really difficult. Um, but that makes it all the more interesting, I think, in both of these cases, that immediately the narrative that does get imposed by scientists and non-scientists alike on these data is the old narrative of the decline of nature that we've seen recur again and again and again since circa 1800. Um, and so that's sort of the broader issue that interests me about this is to what extent is the interpretation of the data, especially when it's transmitted to the public at large, pre-shaped by this narrative, by this narrative template? And, um, and what does it leave out? So in the case of climate change, you know, and species extinction, you know, there's a lot of research on endangered species. There's a lot less research on speciation. How many species are newly emerging? Nobody really knows, at least none of the scientists that I've pointedly asked about this. I asked Stephen Palumbi, my um, former colleague at Stanford, so how many species have humans created, you know, through agriculture and stuff like that, through antibiotics? He said two, one fruit fly, one salmon. Um, you know, that seems sort of, uh, to me as a non-biologist, implausible given th that we still categorize everything from chihuahuas to Great Danes as one species. Um, whereas, you know, with birds, we make species distinctions with much more minute differences. Um, and that's not explained by basic sort of mating behavior or anything like that. So, um, so it, it gets really complicated how we account for, I mean, speciation is something that uh, very little research is being done on so far as I can tell, either in the context of biodiversity developments or in the context of climate change. Who are those, the winner species? You only, that's only ever brought up um, when we talk about the unpleasant species that, you know, the insects that migrate, might mi migrate further. So I think there is a whole other story that deserves to be told here um, without, uh, however, unseating the basic facts. You know, I don't think any, I don't, it's not my intention to enter into any um, contention of the basic facts. We are losing species and the, and the atmosphere <coughs> is heating up. The question is, what do we do with that? What sort of political and social consequences do we draw from that? And who's involved in that conversation? I think those are. Oh, I, I think it plays a huge role, but I've always been, as you know, I've always been a little um, ambivalent about compassion as a means of mobilizing people because it mobilizes people, and we know that to be so. I mean, whenever there's uh, a tsunami or an earthquake, you know, people will donate and generously to people for the, the well-being of people whom they've never laid eyes on, right? Um, but that kind of mobilization tends to be short-term. And it doesn't usually translate into sort of longer commitments. In the case of non-human species, the additional problem is that we feel compassion for animals that are either close to us or that we find attractive. We don't usually, you know, there's no compassion for the smallpox virus or, 
um, you know, or, or microbes, microorganisms that are not, on, or that newt there, that's an interesting move that Sartori made to include species that most people find revolting, you know. A lot of, a lot of people, you know, who are not environmentalists, the snake species goes extinct, they're not sorry about that. So compassion goes only so far, right? So I think it's a powerful, it's a powerful affect, but I think it's sort of limited in what it can do. Um, so that would be my only reservation about it. One more question. The question about whether it's a list or a narrative a database or, or something that you can identify with through sequence or the way things reorganize the experience, it seems like in each of those cases, it's still very much the reflective symbolic capacity of humans to manage mm -hmm. and manipulate data. Right. Only humans could be the ones, for instance, who could reflect upon themselves as a species among species right. and represent but the question I have is, wouldn't then, if there's really no longer a strong sentimental or human or anthropomorphic focus, if we just recognize we're the only ones who are in a position to potentially manage the future, that the better expenditure of energy is not so much on the front of trying to maintain huge habitats and environments where there's so many political barriers, but instead what you're seeing happen like in Norway with the huge, um, in the permafrost, the huge The area. Svalberg. Yeah, when they're putting, mm -hmm. it, there are other ways, in other words, to capture the code of biodiversity that kind of do an end run around everything except the activating features of, of the organism. So maybe that would be a more, I mean, why would, what if, if whether it's a list or a narrative, it still seems like it's not giving us the tour of a long-term way that we could potentially archive what's meaningful about the species we're in. Um, so I'm not sure that I agree with that. I mean, I think for me, these, these seed banks and, um, and gene collections are actually, they're another way of, of, they're another memory archive, right? They're another, I mean, just like these data banks try to sort of store um, and I mean, some of these databases are actually trying to store genetic information and genetic sequences um, of species. So not all of them are as as textually inclined as as the IUCN is. That's one that um, I, as a literary scholar, can more easily read than some of the others. But um, but they're not all structured in the same way. But the seed bank, for example, I think what's interesting about that is that it actually does impose exactly the same kind of narrative of loss and decline on humanly created species and subspecies, right? And when you read Michael Pollan, there is, um, uh, I mean, you might expect that at least in the context of something like agriculture, that there might also be a moment of reflection on the enormous creativity of, that humans have, um, have shown in their interaction with other species and the creation of innumerable subspecies and variants, as well as on these two occasions, new species. Um, but um, but that's not the case. I mean, the, when you read any books about um, about agriculture, the tone again is predominantly elegiac. You know, so Michael Pollan will go on and on about how oh we had six thousand species of apples in the nineteenth century, and now you go into the average supermarket and you only find twelve or something. You know, and so that's where the seed banks come in as a preservation of this. Um, and you know, and now I mean, there's increasing talk of possibly reconstituting extinct species through, um, you know, incomplete genomes that we have that, you know, like the, the um, Pleistocene Park project in Russia, um, where they're uh, thinking about taking what there is of mammoth DNA and plugging in elephant DNA where, where information is missing and possibly reconstituting the mammoth. Um, so so um, I think what that doesn't solve is sort of, so where is this mammoth then going to live? I mean, where are the habitats that we put these animals back into? But I do think that these are, I, well, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by long term, but I mean, certainly for the next 300 years. Yeah. That seems to be the problem with all of these yeah. is when you say like in the last 50 years or 30 years, all of these changes have happened. The only way that you could really imagine right. Right. Lasts, you know. It's just more an idea of how you would keep alive right. the code or the narrative, not, not as a narrative about what's lost or gained, but just to have the action. 
cover our city costs. So I guess I'm saying it's less sentimental than, wouldn't that be where the best allocation resource is allocated? No, I, I, no I, that, 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 I would, that formulation I think I would agree with, yeah. No, I think that's true, and I think that, you know, in that context, this idea of the database as an essentially decentimentalized storage, air, storage site um, that then can be mobilized for a variety of different kinds of uses and narratives does come in handy. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you